Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm very glad you're here, Paul, because I absolutely want to repeat the adjective that I uh, used last time, miracle worker. I mean, he's not just my friend and my colleague, but really he gets these beautiful and wonderful things together. It's uh, really great. Safwan was here yesterday. I'm very fortunate to have him as a friend. He's a visionary, but this guy. Uh, Anyway, Paul, thanks for coming. And uh, this is a, a bit of a scary uh, task for me, frankly, because yesterday I was at home with young geniuses. But these folks are like very impressive, heavy duty folks. <laughs> and I'm, so I'm a little, I'll try my best. You save me if I'm asking the wrong questions and so on, okay? That's a deal. So our topic is rewriting history. Um, and I, I really have here, we have here two people who are uh, doing that for India. The whole um, idea of rewriting history is very, um, is very diversified, it seems to me, because sometimes when we are abroad, we hear uh, the idea of discovering India again, emergent nation, uh, becoming well-known, wonderful, yes, welcome, you know, like tradition rather than history and so on. One does if one work, walks the UNESCO circuit. Whereas our um, uh, idea of rewriting history is also complicated. And for your friend uh, Ritu Menon, I did the thing at Kennedy Center, and I was a little scared. I knew she would protect me, uh, but uh, I suggested that our great uh, nationalist leaders, in fact, had to use a species of Orientalism to discover an India, uh, Nehru and Gandhi and Tagore and so on. This was not exactly the correct thing to say. Orientalism is supposed to be the other side. So to an extent, our notion of rewriting history uh, is complicated. And if I may, before I give the floor over to you, if I may just uh, say something which you can certainly challenge, and Sanjay, you probably will because of your uh, ambivalent position about the so-called post-structuralists, but is do it does seem to me that in some ways history is always rewriting. That's why we have something called historiography. The uh, French uh, philosopher, well, French, uh, Levinas, um, when he was talking about human beings coming into being, he said that there is immediately something called memory, mm. although there is not necessarily something being remembered. So that to an extent, it seems to me that the relationship between history and truth is a little bit like the relationship between law and justice. Mm. It is just that there be law, but law is not justice. So that to an extent, the task of rewriting is that this peculiar relationship between history and truth. And it seems to me that uh, I want to start there because for me, rewriting history is the historiography that this is exactly not uh, changing the textbooks. You know what I mean? There is no such thing. So um, I want to start with um, Urvashi. Um, uh, Urvashi, of course, um, Urvashi and I have known each other for uh, some time, and I think one of the greatest things that you did was to uh, co-establish Kali for Women, the publishers. I mean, that is just such a wonderful, wonderful publisher. The, the, the line for Kali is just fantastic. You can always, in fact, one of the authors we were doing yesterday, Gitanjali Shri, her translation is, yes. is Kali. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you've won many prizes, um, uh, Padma Shri being the India government um, uh, honor, we, so therefore we don't quite know how to uh, think about it. I have won one. Uh, yes, exactly. I have won <laughs> one of those two. And so we, 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 we talk about the fact that we cast them aside, but they're there. And so um, 
the, um, uh, there are many more things that one could say, but I think the book that really turned um, uh, the, the, the picture of um, history around was your other uh, side of silence. Mm -hmm. That book, the book which talked about um, uh, the partition of India at independence, the price of independence, as it were. That was the one that was like completely mind-boggling, and that's how you became really a rewriter of history, as it were. And um, I have a very special connection with you there, Rashi, because, of course, my parents, well, my, not my parents, my father, well, they are from East Bengal, that mm -hmm. is to say, they also, and my mother, uh, from the time, and I'm older than both of you, so I was born, um, I was sentient at the time of the Calcutta riots. I've written about that in yes. Nationalism and the Imagination. And also the partition, and my mother, we never saw her when we were very small, because very early in the morning she would go to Shelda Station to, you know, the refugee rehabilitation mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So that and the riots, of course, I mean, I really want you to speak rather than myself, but there is so much to say. I mean, especially when you're slightly older and you were there to hear, you know, Hari Wol, Hari, and then Allahu mm -hmm. Akbar, and mm -hmm. you knew that with each one of them, each one of those cries, it was a machete, because that's how it was, it was done in Calcutta, not guns or anything. So, therefore, I thought that the riots once again bring perhaps objections and hecklers. I'm glad that's all it was. But at any rate, so therefore I have this uh, connection with you, and the last thing that I want to say before I ask you a question is that, you know, my um, mother and I, especially, it was really my mother, not so much me, we worked with the war raped in the Bangladesh uh, mm -hmm. war, eh? mm -hmm. and I had uh, all of these amateur photographs taken by us, I mean, they're now called Biranganas, right? And I never did anything with them. Mm. And in fact, Nayanika Mukherjee yeah. heard that I had these, mm. and perhaps in conversation, and she came. And I realized that the, the silent subaltern woman, I had actually seen them first in 1972-73, mm. when there were, uh, we were surrounded by these war-raped women, and especially the, their photographs were in my album. And, and you have commented on the fact that people, uh, Kamla Patel, for example, did not speak about this. And the, the woman who really stands out is the one repeatedly raped by the soldiers who had completely stopped talking, mm. stopped reacting. Mm. And there she is in mm. my photo album. I never did anything with mm. them mm. until Nayonika came, mm. took them, wrote a book which is about to come out, and so there, that also strikes a chord. I'm, as it were, exhibit one for you. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, your idea of uh, how you were really rewriting, especially with reference to women, many layers, and the fantastic book you wrote, how you were really rewriting history, The Price of Independence, when you began to do, and your Yahya, reminds me of her Rana Mama, frankly. <laughs> so, you know, so how you began to think of rewriting history okay. with this project? Okay, thank you, Gayatri. Um, I never thought that I would be sitting on a panel with Gayatri and Sanjay, and Gayatri would call me a heavyweight, you know. If you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a bit um, <laughs> sort of weighed under by that. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I'm not a historian by training. I don't even think of myself as a historian. I studied history up until my master's degree, which was a very long time back. And after that, I became a publisher. So I'm what I call an accidental historian. I fell into the history of partition completely accidentally through two personal experiences, and not really as one might imagine, through a dissatisfaction with or a questioning of the current kinds of histories of partition that existed, although that came later. But I fell into this history partly because I am a child of refugee parents uh, and like all people of my generation, someone who had paid no attention at all to the human sides of the history of partition who had thought of those stories as just old people's stories and dismissed them. 
1984, two things happened, uh, three things happened to change my life. Two of them have a direct bearing on this. One is that I was asked by some friends to do the research for a film they were making on partition, and they were looking for someone who could find people to interview. So I started talking to people. And the second is Indira Gandhi was killed in Delhi by her Sikh bodyguards. And this city that I had known all my life suddenly changed and became a violent, scary city where people who had lived with each other in harmony suddenly were killing each other. I'm a Sikh by origin, but not by appearance. But the name is a giveaway. So as a middle-class privileged person living in Delhi who had led a fairly free and somewhat sheltered life, I had never thought violence was so close to the surface. I had never felt vulnerable. And suddenly, my Sikh identity marked me as the community to be targeted, although, paradoxically, women were less visible at that time because they don't look so different because they don't wear turbans. So I worked with a large group, an NGO, which was working with the people affected by the violence of 84. And my job was to take down people's testimonies so that we could sue for compensation <coughs> claims after. And it was when I started to listen to those testimonies that I heard so many things about partition. People would say to me, this is like partition again. We never expected it in our own family and so on, in our own country. And I suddenly began to think that if five days of violence could shake people in this way, what must that time have been like? And I started to question my own refusal to engage with the history in my own family and decided to explore the family history. So it was really a completely personal exploration. There was no thought that I was doing history. There was no thought that I was doing anything other than tracking the family story. And once I started to track the family story, it led me to a whole lot of other stories. So I sort of did this completely randomly. Had I been a historian by training, I would have chosen an area, a period, a sample, or any of those things. I know historians don't necessarily choose samples. But nevertheless, I, I just went randomly at this history over a 10-year period, talking to anybody and everybody who looked like a likely person who might have lived through the partition. And the stories shook me and shocked me and also humbled me. And it was at the end of 10 years that I thought, OK, I'm going to put together a book of these stories. And when I put together the book, that's when I started, or when I started to write the book, I started to explore existing histories of partition, which was really what, was, what led me to a deep dissatisfaction at the blindness of those histories to the experiences of ordinary people, questions about how history can accommodate uh, ordinary people's stories, how history can accommodate things like emotion, feelings, pain, grief, loss, or is it not the job of the historian to look at these things, and questions about the invisibility of women, and the nature of the silence, particularly relating to sexual violence, which I, as a feminist, thought, OK, people have not talked about women. Women were mass raped at that time. There's a history of the sexual violence, sexual assault on 100,000 women. I'm the feminist. I'll go in and break this silence and liberate this history. I cannot tell you how wrong that assumption was. And when I went in, I learned so much about the need to retain certain silences, the responsibility of the historian, the ethics of doing feminist research. So all of these things came to me in the process of doing this work. This work came to be called history, uh, which is something I didn't intend. I was absolutely blissfully free of disciplinary boundaries, and I'm still there because I don't have a career in history. I'm a publisher. I'm not really interested in establishing that I'm a historian. <laughs> Many historians, including the subalterns, disliked it and felt it wasn't history who's this interloper, which is okay for me. You know, I don't really care because they, they can say what they like. So um, in a sense, really, to, it's a long answer to say I don't think of myself as a historian, Gayatri. I think of myself as an independent researcher who pursues the subjects that she likes, is interested in, is politically engaged in, 
Some of them end up being historical, but most of them are contemporary. And the real question for me is, is history about the past or is it about the now? So I don't know, maybe Sanjay can answer that. I will, come, I will uh, ask uh, Sanjay a question that comes out of this. But you see, one of the things that um, I very much uh, like, in, of course, the funny thing is tangentially, I am connected to the post-structuralist. That odious word was, in fact, invented by me. If anybody <laughs> has heard it used before 1973, I will give a small prize because it will take the word away from me. <laughs> it's a wrong and ugly word, post-structuralist, but alas, I was too young to know better. But anyway, so I connect with them tangentially, and of course I'm also c tangentially connected to the subaltern studies folks, and yet I'm uh, exceptional in that sense. You know, I can, in fact, read both Urvashi Butalia and Sanjay Subramaniam with great enjoyment. The thing that I really um, liked in your uh, book, apart from everything else, was that you insisted on story, narrative, story. And there, the relationship between history and not fiction, but mm -hmm. testimony, yes. it becomes very important because quite often you see an irresponsible use of so-called cultural memory so that you privatize historiography and anything goes. But that's not the way that you uh, did it. So whether you want to call yourself a historian or not, for those of us who are very much not historians, it was a, a wonderful break to see that thing. I mean, there is a claim to veridicality there. I mean, fiction uh, is singular and unverifiable, but not testimony. Testimony mm -hmm. wants to say eyewitness, and yet its relationship to historiography is complicated, yeah? yeah? And that's what I found. And when you come to the women, and you say silences must be kept, um, I want to ask uh, Sanjay a question about the particular, the micro, rather than the general, which is very much also your thing, but the moment when, a woman says, you know, I mean, you don't need theorists there. It is theory. A woman says, and you know, people were not taking back some of the women who were recovered, etc. as you write very carefully. A woman says, well, you know, it's difficult because to an extent, what is marriage but, but exactly. ab abduction? Yes. I quote, abduction, I mean, not word for word, uh, abduction by an unknown man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a question I put to my mother. Mm -hmm. How was it that mm -hmm. first night? You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. <laughs> you see, so, I mean, that was just so amazing because mm. this whole Victorian notion of the romantic marriage is a, a, a moment in history. Mm. And so, <laughs> the, uh, it was just, I really felt that it was rewriting also the history of a certain kind of gendering by looking at this sort of rape in general yeah. as something understood by women in another way. Mm. I, Sanjay, you can see that I'm so, uh, there's <laughs> such solidarity there that, that I'm stopping myself and then allowing myself the pleasure of questioning you. Um, uh, Sanjay Subramaniam, as you know, is at the Collège de France, so I don't really need to introduce him here, but um, I'm very happy to uh, be on a panel with you, Sanjay. And uh, the, uh, your book, uh, three Ways to be Alien is a very interesting uh, uh, book indeed. I've read it with some attention and because it's very much in my neck of the woods. And also, the, uh, what, um, uh, this is perhaps not a very, uh, very um, important point, but nonetheless, the French title is Comment être un étranger. Allez, qu'est-ce que c'est? Three ways, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, and there's only one a way uh, in French of being an étranger? Uh, this is the, <laughs> uh, you probably have the experience like me of dealing with publishers uh, in languages that you do know, mm. but where they don't <laughs> consider you to be at the same level of authority as oh. them. So uh, <laughs> then they'll say, ah, mais ça se dit pas comme ça en français. Allez. Uh, it's not like this that you say things in French. Uh, it's maybe grammatically correct, but you know, you shouldn't be saying this. So. I mean, of course, as you uh, surely realized, and probably Urvashi, I'm sure you also realized, I mean, the first title was already a kind of a, um, was a playful title based on the book by George Mikash, 
Mm. Or ask the poem by Wallace Stevens, mm. but that's that fine. That too, well, how to be alien. Uh, <laughs> yes, be alien. Uh, and uh, so, of course, that already didn't pass because uh, actually the, uh, the book by Mikesh was never translated into French. And I also have to say, when I looked it up on Google, uh, the closest title which I find now is a book which is called Three Ways to Snog an Alien. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, which is uh, it's a, it's a story by itself. Yes. So, so anyway, so my publisher just wouldn't, he wouldn't let me uh, impose my title. And in fact, every book I publish in French, I have the same fights. And they never let me have my titles, and they always want to have their titles. I have a fight in English. Yeah. Amatya Sen changed my title, Don't Call Me Postcolonial, yes. to Critique of Postcolonial Reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, surely I'm sorry I'm telling my own story. No, but, but I that's what I say. What the but the I have to Professor defend Sen my tribe. Uh -huh. Publishers know quite a lot about titles. <laughs> 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 All right. That. We'll, we'll, we'll stop there. I'll ask you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask you a question, and, and of course I should mention that you hold an endowed chair at UCLA, and uh, that you are really are, although I have met your teacher, we were talking about him, one of your teachers, and I was very impressed by his research, but we think of um, Sanjay really in terms of uh, economic history, uh, and the history of econ Indian economy as it were, even my mother read you. Because my mother had a question, which she went to the India Office Library and she wanted to look at the East India Company ledgers, okay? And they suddenly told her that she had to have a project. She had no project, she just wanted to look at those. And so she made up a project. She says, how did the British take all of our variegated systems of the Shubankuri and the this and the that, etc., and establish one system, okay? And I said to her later, so they let her look at the ledgers. She made this up. And I said, Ma, you should read Sanjay Subramaniam. And she did read. But my question to you is also, how did this move into this micro history? I would almost say epistemological history, how we construct and know ourselves, as it were, and you come to an end saying they did not become cosmopolitans and so on. How, did, uh, how do the two things come together, or were they always together? Well, it's a, it's a um, complicated story, so I should give you a very short version of it. So, uh, it's true that, actually, you know, you said that you're an accidental historian. I think probably at least half of historians are accidental mm -hmm. historians. And very few people that I know, you know, uh, I mean, there's some in the audience who bec were or historians by the time they were 18 and remained historians. <laughs> but a lot of us actually, you know, drift into it in one fashion or the other. I actually have no degrees in history yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I only have degrees in economics. So, uh, you, which is an interesting thing because I think that history is an interesting discipline from that point of view. It's very porous, it's very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Uh, which shouldn't mean that there's, n there's no kind of uh, 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 possible core of rigor and so on to it, but it does mean that there, there are lots of doors into it. So, um, fairly early on, actually, I moved into working with uh, literary scholars. Uh, I did uh, early uh, joint uh, work with uh, David Shulman and, and mm. Vilcheru Narendra on court cultures, and I kept that conversation open. I worked quite a lot with philologists. Uh, f which is sort of something which comes fairly naturally to someone like me who works on pre-1800 manuscript materials. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular book actually, Three Ways to be Alien, uh, was uh, produced in very particular circumstances. Uh, it was actually delivered as the Menachem Stern Lectures in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it was meant to be partly a kind of a tongue-in-cheek reflection on being in Israel which I think some Israelis in the audience understood. And uh, actually, uh, my friend, uh, late friend now, Mikhail Haid, a uh, specialist of history of emotions and so on, did very much understand that I was, I was playing with this idea. And the second thing, of course, was that, I mean, around that time, in the previous five or six years, I had actually uh, become uh, the colleague of uh, Carlo Ginsberg, and so we used to have very long, contentious lunches and conversations and so on. And I think that that forced me to engage much more with microhistory in a way that I hadn't really so much done before. I had developed a bit of an allergy to microhistory yes. because of the fact that when I was in Paris, you know, microhistory was sort of like the official, you know, not just the flavor of the month, but the flavor of the year and the next year and the next year. Uh, this was uh, because uh, Jacques Revel was the sort of 
uh, he had the, as we would say in, in, in Hindi, the theka on microhistory over here. He was sort <laughs> of selling it from his little shop. So he wanted all of us to do this, and I refused to do it. And I said, no, I will actually resist microhistory. I resisted it, and then, of course, meeting Ginsburg changed my mind about it. So it's actually partly all those mixed trajectories, the engagement with literature, the engagement with philology, the engagement with, uh, with uh, uh, Ginsburg's version of microhistory, which is different from uh, Giovanni Levy's version of microhistory, which was the one which was being sold in Paris. Say a little, say a little. About uh, you see, jo Giovanni Levy wrote this book, which is called... Uh, L'Ereditam Immateriale, which is a, a book which is about an exorcist in a, in a village in, the, in, the, in Piedmont. Uh, it's a very funny book because on the one hand it's focused on this individual, it does the archives having to do with this exorcist and so on, so it's sort of typically those kinds of things because the Inquisition of course is always interested in these kinds of funny characters. But then it, it kind of goes into this very strange social science apparatus of the land market and how the Piedmont is sort of a, in the global capitalist uh, land market and how all of this has to do with that and so on, which is completely unconvincing connections. Um, and so I didn't really take very much to that. Whereas, I mean, I think I could see how, you know, Ginsburg's idea, which is really to tease things really out of the very specific, without losing its specificity, that was finally a much more attractive idea towards, for me. So that's, in a way, um, I mean, I, I, I think, and I think I even say this in the preface, uh, the book does bear, uh, I think, the traces of my engagement with that, with, with that microhistory mm. from a you know, purely uh, aleatory thing. I mean, if I had not gone to UCLA, if I had not spent five years talking to Ginsburg, I probably wouldn't have written that book. That's the way those things happen. Yes. I want to get back to Rashi, but I want uh, to ask just one uh, question there. How uh, do you feel about uh, the claim which for us, again, non-historian, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a non-historian reader of history. I like uh, very brilliant empirical research because I can't do it and it teaches me things. But how do you, I was, m among m many of us were unconvinced by the claim that economic connections, you know, let's say the Indian Ocean Rim or between Kunming and Bengal and so on, necessarily brought in uh, cultural um, connections. Of course, in a certain way, cultural change, yes. But when one thinks of self-fashioning and individuals and so on and so forth, that, it, that idea that economic patterns, you know, so that the regular history, events, kings, etc., that should be undone not only by uh, the ideas of long durée and so on, but also the idea that the actual units were those ocean rims rather than, and those kinds of routes rather than the Silk Route and so on and so forth, rather than just dynastic history. I'm speaking as an amateur and reader of history, not a historian, obviously, so you'll forgive me. But we did not find that idea of uh, cultural change because of economic um, circuits altogether convincing. And I particularly, when Gunda Frank in his uh, Reorient book was talking about Kunming and Bengal, the White Horses and Sugar and so on, being someone who has been very much into the history of uh, the development of something called Bengal, I was wondering how much of this, we now do K to K, Kolkata to Kunming, you know that Hari Vasudeva and I. <laughs> but nonetheless, how do you feel about that argument that the economic roots? Well, I mean, I, I, the, the, f the fact of the matter is that the Frank is never somebody I've taken very seriously. Uh, because, I mean, this is someone who really, you know, he, he also stumbled into history like a lot of us. But I think, for instance, that someone like him, who was a sort of an old dependency theory uh, kind of Marxist, mm -hmm. uh, he never, for instance, I don't think he ever understood cultural history uh, at all as, as, as a phenomenon. So uh, he didn't ever really address it very seriously. And for him, it's very natural, this kind of you know, base superstructure type of reasoning. Mm. Uh, so it follows that you, know, you have uh, trade connections. Uh, it follows that commodities get exchanged. Therefore, cultural chain gets sort of comes out in the wash. Uh, that's the kind of, uh, of, of reasoning that they have in mind. Um, whereas it's sort of not at all self-evident that it works in that kind of way. But nevertheless, I mean, I, I was just talking a little earlier to Urvashi about this. But let's, for instance, uh, take something which I think would be much more uh, um, reasonable and familiar, uh, which is, for instance, let's take the relations between uh, uh, Bengal, especially Eastern Bengal, and what would today be Northern Burma. Mm. 
Yes. Hmm? Now, uh, we don't study these things together no. today, uh, either in India or in Burma, or in Bangladesh for the most part, because the national boundaries have made it so that these are separate histories. Uh, of course, now in Burma, there's very violent Buddhist reaction against Muslims, and mm -hmm. there are these Muslim populations present in northern yes. Burma, the Rohingyas and so on, which who for them are a, are, are a kind of an execrescence or something which has to be gotten rid of. But the reality of it is this, that, I mean, uh, whatever you may eventually think of the overall importance of it in a kind of formation of a Bengali literary canon, for instance, there's no doubt that uh, these writings that were produced you know, in the 16th and 17th century, and there's a French scholar, uh, Thibaut Hubert, who's mm -hmm. written uh, now quite a lot about it, between northern Burma and, and eastern Bengal. Yes. Uh, people like uh, Alaol, uh, Daulat Qazi, and so on. Uh, these things do count for something. And these were actually produced in these, in these circuits, circuits of trade, but also circuits of kidnapping and slavery, because, you know, slaving expeditions would come out of Burma and uh, take uh, slaves out of uh, northern Bengal. Uh, but there were also courtly uh, interchanges and so on. So one can see a kind of an interesting cultural complex uh, which is related to certain kinds of material movements as well. Whether there is a, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not going to argue that there's some kind of a causal, simple causal relationship or a determ determining relationship, but it's, I think, useful to think about these as, as, it as has other to circuits. be worked at. Yeah. It had, had elaborare is mm -hmm. what our mm -hmm. project should be. Mm -hmm. And I'll come to you outside of this room because we are now trying to do something called old histories and uh, n new histories and old geographies, where the northern Myanmar, all of these n Himalayan studies and stuff, which is really not respecting national boundaries. Mm -hmm. As you know, Beijing is not particularly happy with Kunming for yeah. looking south. But that's another story altogether. So we, um, uh, in terms of what uh, you uh, did, uh, Urvashi, it seems to me what you also questioned in terms of this question of culture that we kind of ended at, you also looked at uh, culture as not something today, unfortunately, since I'm supposed to be very much in so-called cultural, yes, you're smiling. The unexact, that's why I said don't call me post-colonial. I am very much into this uh, cultural studies thing where somehow one is, and I think a political situation with migrants in Europe has something to do with it, but and at first, of course, with Black Britons to at all, the idea that somehow we can speak for our culture. Culture is somewhere, it seems to me like history being Re always um, rewriting. Mm -hmm. Culture mm -hmm. is its own counterexample. The moment you can say culture, you close it off, invented by anthropology as it were. But if you are in it, you think it's human nature. So that to an extent, that idea that you can't claim culture, that comes out very much in, uh, in what you write. I mean, you're, when one reads it, it looks like you're saying that you had to rethink it this kind of idea of discrete uh, culture, especially in terms of your grandmother when you write mm. it that mm -hmm. way, that you have to re what did she think? Mm. What, how did she live? Mm. I have the same question about my great-grandmother who was given in widow remarriage. I've mm. written about mm. it in mm. something called mm. Four Mothers. You and I really resonate on that mm -hmm. question. Mm. You know, what are uh, the outlines mm. of that? So I would like you to talk a little bit about the question of culture as you understand it also mm -hmm. in the context of today, India today, mm -hmm. I don't mean the journal, mm -hmm. um, the <laughs> it should be called a magazine, but in the context of our lives in that country today, thinking about Kashmir, for example, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about that context, the history of the present, as you were mm -hmm. saying, is mm -hmm. it then or now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you say that. I mean, just going back to the debate, the, the discussion that you and Sanjay were having, um, to me the question really is, um, can history be therefore contained within just the national boundaries? And if you uh, look at, let's say, the history of the Bangladesh War of Independence in 71, how interesting it would be to have Pakistanis and Bangladeshis jointly explore that history and jointly explore what happened, in my particular interest, what happened to women during that time. Similarly, the history of Kashmir, you know, how interesting it would be to actually remove that boundary between their Kashmir and our Kashmir mm. and actually look at history 
with different kind of patterns. So that's one question that I have in my mind. The other question, uh, what Sanjay was talking about and the question that you raised about um, can economic um, journeys and economic changes lead to cultural change on the ground? How do you read that change back into a history of the past? Um, again, I mean, again, I, this is from the point of view of a lay person who really isn't steeped in the discipline of history. How would you read cultural change into a past where you cannot actually see women, children, minorities, or anything other than the, the most visible aspects of that past, which inevitably would be the aspects that have been documented and that are not lost to, to us. So how would you have a map of cultural change which is at all complex, which is at all nuanced, which is, I don't know, at all um, acceptable or possible? I, I really don't know how it can be done. So, uh, I mean, the, the flip side of that question to me would be um, the feminist turn in history, and I'm maybe going a little away from what you're saying, but the feminist turn in history which helps us to look at invisible histories and to try and understand them in all their complexity, is that only limited to the history of the recent past? Or can you actually train that feminist lens on histories of the past in order to map cultural and other kind of change? I don't know. The question of culture in India today, which as you well know, both of you know, many of us know, is a very, very troubled one. And at many levels today, we are having to deal with the issue of um, uh, who are the custodians of culture and who dictates what culture is. What is our culture? Yeah, yes. and it is really uh, a, a cultural, framework that is so being sought to be imposed which uh, with all the political might behind it. But the sad part of it is with also so much resonance among so many Indians and with so much acceptability. Including the educated young. Who yes, don't remember including the educated young, including the, including those for whom, from whom you might have obviously hoped for a secular imagination, um, including my breed of publishers, let's say. I mean, it's very disturbing for me to be in that world where people who are the purveyors of knowledge and who essentially believe in the freedom of knowledge and expression are today censoring themselves and limiting what they bring out? Well, that's, uh, I mean, we are really now approaching something where uh, we, we could go on interminably. So uh, what I would uh, like to bring us uh, back into, f away from those uh, mysterious thickets where we are now <laughs> caught forever, I hope not forever, the, uh, when you do your, this latest work, where you talk about Todorov, for example, a good bit I saw, ah. but um, do you, in fact, uh, I haven't really noticed uh, you doing this, but are you interested in thinking that uh, women would not quite uh, fit this notion of the cusp figures, the, the, how would it make it, does it ever interest you? I mm -hmm. just want to say this, that in Vienna, for the Kreisky Forum, I suggested, they were asking me about diaspora, and I feel the same way that you do, that the first diaspora, the Alexandria Codex, that's a very, very different notion of diaspora from the way it's being claimed now. And I suggested that they should think about the fact that women in exogamous marriages are the original diasporic. They're tacitly globalized, mm -hmm. not uh, knowingly collectively, but uh, I suggested this. So I was just wondering if it um, excites you or interests you to think of how it would be if one wanted to look at um, gendered figures, f women, in the, these kinds of... Uh, yeah, actually, you know, one of the, one of the uh, uh, difficulties uh, with, uh, you know, moving uh, from 
relatively recent histories to relatively <coughs> older histories is, uh, uh, you know, what gets, what is, what is uh, left in and what is left out. I mean, you know, you, we often use metaphors like, you know, having a conversation with the archive or a mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. with the documents, which is, of course, just <coughs> a metaphor. It's not true at all. Because, I mean, you, know, you actually have, uh, when you're dealing with oral histories and living subjects and so on, you have the flexibility or the possibility of yes. taking things in certain directions. And, you know, uh, we who uh, say people like me who work in the 16th or the 17th centuries, I mean, we are very heavily constrained by what is what there for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and with all the massaging and all the creativity and, you know, all the uh, genuflecting to Bakhtin or whatever we want to do, you know, we are finally <laughs> not going to be able to get certain things out of the, we can't, you know, squeeze mm -hmm. blood out of stones. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's, the, that's the difficulty. And, and, and really, the, this is the reason why, you know, we were talking about this. Say, for instance, why, um, why can you sort of literally count on the fingers of two hands, more or less, uh, people who address these kinds of questions with regard to India before 1800? Mm. Mm. Well, we can mention, we know who they are, Uma Chakravarti <coughs> or, mm. or, or Rosalind O'Hanlon or, or, yes. uh, and so on and so forth. We know who they are, but th there's a real difficulty. And, you know, I mean, I remember with Muzaffar Alam, I wrote a book on, uh, on uh, Indo-Persian travel narratives. And we, tr look, we really have scoured all kinds of places to look for all kinds of travel narratives. And we eventually found one text written by a woman. Yes, I wonder why. Between, between 1500 and 1800 that we could find. Yes. You know, we could not find any other, we could not find any other texts. And, um, I mean, certainly if we are to, you know, for instance, the book that we wrote on courtly culture, mm. uh, we, you do find a, a certain, an appreciable number of women yes. poets, for it instance, be, court yes. poets, mm -hmm. um, some of these people from what we would today call Devadasis and so on, who are, who are, who are, who are writing. So there is this, this, this real, this real uh, constraint, it's an objective constraint which is out there. And believe me, I mean, I have a, my, my wife uh, actually has written a book on, on gender and religion in modern France. So it's not as if I'm even exempt from these questions at home, you know? Yes. Uh, so... Uh, the personal is political, yes? Yeah, yeah. But may I, may I just yeah. come in with a question to Sanjay? I think the question that Gayatri asked you is slightly different, mm -hmm. and um, which is, does it excite you? Mm -hmm the possibility of discovering women in history. Um, I'm, you know, I don't want to sound like uh, this, this is not this male-female binary, but yeah. I would be really interested to see whether that is at all a possibility among male historians to get excited by... And also, then, an, an, a supplementary question. I mean, and I would say, um, you, you know, I have been in so many places where when a question is posed to a man about gender, he will say, Sanjay, my wife at home is doing this. And you'll never find it the other way around. So, I, I mean, it's no, okay. No, I why wives yes. do? Women do, do I mean, what they we do. Are yeah. only so don't say it. Don't guy, say it next time. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, I mean, the, the um, other question, one is, does it actually excite you? Mm -hmm. Second is, do you consider the possibility, as the kind of historian you are, who is, as you say, also accidental because you've come from economics, and, um, and you're looking at different things from what the, you know, the mainstream historians, if you like, are uh, looking at. Do you consider the possibility of looking at other sorts of archives? Mm -hmm. Uh, when Gayatri spoke about the pictures, you know, which uh, she had of um, 1771, 70, 72, the visual, the letters, the ephemera, the diaries, is, is there, I mean, does it actually um, mean something to you to look at those? If I was entering the field of history formally, mm -hmm. that's where it would lead me, you know, that's where I would want it to lead me. So I'm just curious about this. Yeah. Be, uh, if I can just add, because what you would get from women, like you only found one woman writing, would not resemble what you get from men, because they live in two different worlds. But let's hear. Well, I'm not sure they live in two different worlds, but that aside, um, the, the, the question is, is uh, you know, well, first of all, I mean, I should tell you that quite a lot of my, my uh, recent work uh, uh, actually is, is very, very much uh, interested in engaging with the visual. Mm. Uh, there's, in fact, quite mm. a large chunk of mm. my last book, which, mm. which is precisely dealing mm. with the visual. And, and actually, in the case of, of for instance, the Mughals, the visual is a very, very extensive and yeah. very rich, rich archive. Mm. It's, it's very layered and so on mm. and so forth. 
But, you know, there again, it's, I mean, let me uh, actually say to you that, you know, it has to do with, with various kinds of things. I mean, for instance, there is a, uh, I'll give you a, a, a kind of a, uh, another example. You know, for instance, it's extremely uh, difficult to uh, write about uh, certain kinds of, the histories of certain kinds of caste groups yeah. in the uh, period before colonial ethnography. Because uh, it's relatively difficult to find uh, written traces, uh, or even if you're willing to extend the archive very uh, much, as people do tend to do. And so you get this, this kind of difficulty. Now, I mean, again, you could say to me, as people sometimes do say to me, you know, you are an upper caste, uh, you know, Hindu male. Uh, I mean, not much of a Hindu, but still an upper caste male. So, um, you know, then where are you in relation to these kinds of, these kinds of things, which, which actually, uh, I mean, how much are you a prisoner in that sense of mm. your, own, your own narrow identity or, or whatever it is? And, um, and I would say that, you know, I mean, I think that not just me, but, um, you know, it would, it would really be splendid if one could find uh, the, 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 the ways of sort of breaking out of, out of these things. And I have to say that for me, this is one of the reasons why uh, I often find conversations uh, with historians who are not historians of India, mm. you know, very, very, very useful. Yeah. Because I think, for instance, that in the case of the, of the, the question of sort of, of gender histories, uh, historians of Southeast Asia in the period that I work mm. with have actually done work which speaks to me mm. uh, in, in very many ways. And I have sometimes wonder, you know, can't we do that kind of stuff? And then there's a question of what, what do they work with? What do we work with? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I don't mean to say that, you know, my wife uh, stays at home, she makes the samosas and she does the feminist history. Mm. No, uh, I know you don't mean yeah. that. No, so, uh, yeah. I know you don't mean yeah. that. I mean, no, but I nonetheless, you see what uh, um, I think, I mean, I'm kind of uh, entering into this, not just as the moderator, because, I mean, th th let's admit it, we're interested in mm -hmm. uh, this as three Indians of three slightly different kinds. And so, uh, what I, I think I would say is that it is a question of rethinking historiography a little. I mean, that's where we began. It's the archaeology of knowledge, as it mm -hmm. were. Yeah. You know, you have to, uh, to coin a phrase. Uh, to, you have to really think, I mean, the person who is supposed, you know, Foucault said to uh, uh, Joe Buttigieg that Gramsci is cited more than he is understood. I quote. Now, the thing is, Foucault actually cites Gramsci less than he should. So, you know, when Gramsci is talking about subaltern historiography, people who did not achieve the state, people who did not, in fact, what I guess old-fashioned mm -hmm. Marxism would call achieve class consciousness and so on, okay, when, of course, they were not within capitalism, he's saying that you will have to write a history of a different sort. Of course, he's not a historian, but, he's, but none that he isn't either. But he's talking about... I find this in the work of our friend Shahid Amin, a little mm -hmm. of all the subalternists, yeah, yeah. that you will have to go into a kind of history writing which is uh, not like uh, the regular object, which doesn't focus on regular objects of history. I mean, you are yourself already so adventurous in moving into this uh, three ways. Huh? Mm -hmm. It just, so I guess what we are both saying is that perhaps the limits of historiography need to be questioned a little so that this doesn't just remain a problem. Yeah, and if I, if yeah. I could just come in here um, with an example of, because it also means uh, confronting your own, as you also said, confronting your own blind spots, confronting your own biases. And I always uh, think back to this time when I was doing my research and when I um, came across, uh, accidentally, without trying, a woman who is a sweeper in a college uh, and who was about 16 during partition. Mm. Her name is Maya Rani and I was talking to her and um, suddenly I heard a different narrative. Yes. I heard a narrative not of loss and grief and pain, but a narrative of um, great joy and say, she said to me that uh, the village in which she lived, a small village called Dinanagar, it was rumored to be uh, sometimes on the Indian side and sometimes on the Pakistani side because it, the border had not yet been drawn. And uh, she said every time the rumor flew that it would go to Pakistan, all the Hindus would abandon their houses and mm -hmm. run away. And every time the contrary rumor flew, that it would happen the other way around. And she said, I, I and my friends 
kept a watch and leapt into every house and stole everything we possibly Fantastic could. Fantastic stuff. And, uh, and she said, you know, I built my dowry out of that, gold mm -hmm. jewelry, blankets, and, you know, utensils, the whole works, and so all of us created uh, wealth for ourselves. And I said to her, how come you escaped the violence? Mm. And she said, because we are Dalits, we are not Hindus or Muslims. And for me, suddenly the caste question became very, very clear in that. And I realized the, the blind spot that I had also had in that. And I started to explore the history of uh, Dalits in Punjab and discovered enough documented evidence to show that they had been a really solid politically organized group that they were in a majority in certain places, that like the Hindus and Muslims who had demanded a homeland, they too had demanded a homeland of their own. Mm. And it surprised me that this had not formed the stuff of history at all. But in a sense, it's like you come up against your own blind spot and you see something that, that you don't, you know, that doesn't otherwise reveal itself to you. I think that happens only in micro histories as well. So yeah, but I, I mean, I have to say something else which you know, may or may not, um, you know, make, make uh, sense to you. But, uh, you know, I mean, one of my, um, you could call it a prejudice, mm. is that um, I'm really not looking for things in history which necessarily have to do with questions of, um, in a very direct way, at, le at least, of myself and my identity. Mm. Of what? I'm not looking in, in the kind of history that I do for things that answer questions very much of myself and my identity Thank in a God. very directly in a very direct way. And this sets me apart from many other historians, especially in America, who yes. are essentially, you know, driven by these these identity <laughs> questions, <laughs> whose first questions and whose last questions are identity questions, exactly. and who think that they will only address the objects that actually respond to these identity questions. Now, I'm not saying that all the history that gets done in these terms is, is, is bad history. But you realize that the two of us are asking you to step out of your identity. Oh, no, no, no. You know. on, the, on the contrary, I think that in some ways you're asking me to, too much to step back into it. Well, mm. think again. Anyway, mm. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, mm. let's, go, let's go into... Yeah, I want to, um, to leave some time for the audience, so let's, uh, let me ask you both um, a similar question. At the end of your book, you write that if I explore this again, then I will go into the possibility of friendships. Mm -hmm. And at the end of your, the one that I've really read carefully is Three Ways to be Alien because it spoke to me more. The, uh, and you write there that the fate of which Yahya complained was perhaps not so unique after all. And both of these uh, wonderful closing statements really speak to me. And I would like you, in turn, to take this up and talk a little bit also about perhaps new work. So, Urvashi, you want to go first? Well, you know, um, as I said, uh, I am an accidental historian. I am also what uh, people call a one-book wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written a book since that one book, which was several years ago, and which is why, Sanjay, to your question, if you feel we're pushing you into stepping into your identity. I mean, for me, it's not really that, I, because I'm not a historian, I don't need to, you know, I engage very deeply politically in the, in the writing, not to say that you don't, but it all comes from a political engagement as an Indian feminist living in India. So the identity question is never absent, but it's not the self-indulgent kind of um, postmodernist identity question uh, at all. I hope not. But anyway, um, uh, so there are a whole range of new things that I've been working on, but for somehow for me, and again this goes back to something Sanjay is saying, the emotional entanglement with partition is so deep that it doesn't leave me, and I don't want it to leave me. So I've become a little bit, you know, like you have those bag ladies who carry their lots of plastic bags around. I've become like the partition lady. So <laughs> people send me their stories, they talk to me about it, then I write about those stories, and somehow they just stay with me, and I feel this enormous <coughs> sense of both privilege and responsibility. Although it's crazy, because the history is a history of 12, 13, 14 million people, nobody knows the real figures. 
I mean, how can one individual in, in any, in a lifetime even, do any justice to it? So I don't even pretend it's that. But really what interests me, continues to interest me, is the histories of ordinary people. And they're all contemporary. There's an oral history for me has been a very enabling way of entering the lives of people. So the kind of work I continue to do is on that. And I have written a couple of essays which, uh, which keep the promise of the book, which are to do with friendships uh, maintained across borders. Uh, but I would really like to explore that more fully, and I don't think it's possible until India and Pakistan allow yes. the um, free travel for researchers and scholars mm -hmm. across uh, those two countries, and that's not likely to happen for a long time, which is a real tragedy. I, I know, I'm going next month, and this mm -hmm. will be my second visit. It's very hard with an Indian passport. But I just want to tell, uh, take uh, the privilege of telling a tiny story, and then I turn to you and with that wonderful last sentence. You know, this idea of uh, friendship, I, obviously, I did work in Bangladesh because it's Bengali, and I'm scared by Delhi. It's uh, the urban radicalism in Delhi for me is a bit of a frighten, frightening thing because it's of the way the, whatever. <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, so in Bangladesh, I'm working at night schools in Champai Nawabganj near the Indian border, right? And of course, they're so poor that although they're Abrahamic folks, they don't eat meat and fish or anything, they eat on, on kurban days, right? Kurbani meat. And so they're eating. And I'm eating also because I like meat. So the women, I mean, you know, illiterate, grassroots is a horrible word, you know, bottom feeding women, they say to me, Appa, we are eating this meat. Why are you eating this meat? They're protecting my religion. Mm -hmm. They because, of course, Kurbani mm -hmm. meat is beef. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just amazing the way, you know, there's, uh, the, the, there was this uh, thing of Bishen Muslim, the mullahs coming mm -hmm. out, the Bahus. But w when they're going into namaz, we're walking from Dhaka airport, right? And they can tell I'm an Indian Hindu. Well, you can now. The, um, uh, the rickshawalas are coming out. Say, oh, the tigers have all gone into uh, do namaz. Come on, let's give, us, give mm -hmm. you a little bit of a rickshaw ride until they come out. Mm -hmm. There is on the ground such possibility of this kind of everyday friendship that someone should really, and I'm glad that you've written some, and I hope you will write more because you will bring in, you know, that Uma Chakravarti's question, what about the Vedic Dasi? Vedic Dasi. You know, as we mm -hmm. go on about Gargi mm -hmm. and Maitre mm -hmm. and Khana and so on, what about the Vedic Dasi, the servant, uh, the, what about the servant woman in the Vedas who's, mm -hmm. who uh, is excavating her? But at any rate, so that's why feminist history is quite often an excavation project, because mm -hmm. we share that problem. But anyway, to come back to your beautiful uh, close about the uh, fate is not so unique after all, and the fact that they did not become uh, cosmopolitans suddenly, uh, because from our neck of the woods, of course, cosmopolitan is not just kind of uh, becoming aware of many kinds of people, but also it's the... Kant's, uh, uh, Kant's uh, challenge to Plato. The Plato's book is called Just Politheia, Constitutions, not Republic, it was a European mistake. But it was just called Constitutions, and so Plato started talking about cosmopolitheia, world governance, which we still don't know what to do about. So it's very, very apposite, the, uh, the idea of the cosmopolitical rather than the cosmopolitan. And I was just wondering if you would say something, because this is the early modern that you talk about, right? Mm -hmm. What, 1530 to 1760 or something like that, you mm -hmm. said. So the beginning of a certain kind of consciousness. How do you, um, how do you um, parse that closing sentence? And what is your new work? Well, uh, as regards to the past, uh, the, 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 you know, the last sentence, I mean, there's, um, a certain amount of work which, which uh, I'm obliged to engage with one way or the other because these are my colleagues, some of them, you know, for instance, Jonathan Israel or mm -hmm. Margaret Jacob and so on, writing about cosmopolitans in the early modern world. And these cosmopolitans always turn out to be, in the case of Israel, they're always Spinozians. And in the case oh, of yeah. Margaret Jacob, they're always Freemasons. And, uh, you know, these are people who, uh, as they say, are strangers nowhere in the world. But you know, being a stranger nowhere in the world it's is not, not a matter of your asserting it. Mm, mm. It's also a question of whether other people think you're a stranger or not. Mm. 
So I mean, the mere fact that you think that you go from one, you know, Hyatt in Manila to another Hyatt in New York, and you think you're a cosmopolitan proves nothing. Nothing. Right? <laughs> so um, uh, I think that that uh, I mean, really, what I was sort of trying to look at in these examples that I took over there, those three and a half chapters, because what you quoted is the first half example of this Berber notable from the early 16th century called Yahya Uttafuft, who was caught sort of between these Moroccan polities and the Portuguese, and eventually the Portuguese thought that he was betraying them, the Berbers thought he was betraying them to the Portuguese, and eventually, so anyway, the Berbers wound up stabbing him in the back, literally. So. I wanted to actually make the point that you know these are I mean all lives if you know finally are uh, are constrained and and uh, again uh, you know um, uh, somewhere else I have written a short essay which is called about go betweens which is called between a rock and a hard place mm. because I mean often that's what being go between in the in these worlds is about it's not unconstrained and self fashioning even in in our friend Greenblatt's version is not unconstrained mm. after all it's actually uh, precisely the constraints that make it make it interesting. So, I, I mean, I think that, that therefore this whole question of, of the cosmopolitan is something which, I mean, at one level may be an, an, an ideal or an illusion, but on another level, I think that it is a, it's, a, it's a kind of a form of, to my mind, I'm sorry to say, Western European ideology also. It's an ideological statement produced by the Enlightenment and, and by the post-Enlightenment, this idea, for instance, you know, which eventually you get incarnated in someone like Lawrence of Arabia, who believes that he can be an Englishman and he can be anything else he wants as well. He can, you know, from one day to another, he can become a Bedouin. Of course, a Bedouin can't become an Englishman from one day yes, to another. Yes, that's right? just the so, problem. Yeah, so, so there is, there is th that side of it. So what am I working on now? Or what, uh, well, very different things, and, but perhaps the thing which will speak most to the kinds of conversations we've been having today is that I do eventually want to finish a book which I started with my uh, friend and colleague, Muzaffar Alam, mm -hmm. which is actually on um, a kind of a counterpart to a book we wrote on per Persian travels. And this is on, on first-person accounts, mm. uh, first-person narratives, uh, again, from the Mughal period. Mm. Uh, very curious, very diverse, very unexpected, many of them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, it's that, you know, that part of it, which is, the, which is the, I mean, one of the reasons why you go into the archives is, is not to have your prejudices confirmed, mm. but, to, but be to, to be surprised. To be surprised. But to be surprised mm -hmm. and to have your prejudices overturned, sure. right? That's mm. one of the reasons why mm. one does this stuff. Mm. And um, so we've actually, you know, been working through this. It's again, it's very interesting, sometimes very close philological work with, uh, with manuscripts and, and so on. And uh, I mean, eventually also, I think that it also has quite a lot to do with this whole question. I mean, finally, which the Mughal period is quite a lot about, which is religious boundaries and differences and so on. So whether eventually we write it in, you know, flying the flag and beating people over the head with it, or whether people read it between the lines, I suppose they will understand that it has something to do with uh, India uh, as it is today as well. May I ask Sanjay a quick question? Yeah. Uh, my question uh, to you is um, about writing accessible history. Yes. Um, is it, as a historian, something that you have had to, is it has come naturally to you to write accessible history or do you have to cultivate a transparency of, of writing? Do you see... You know, this, but you know, this is actually a, a, it's a strange fight that uh, I've been having, which not is of my choosing. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, uh, from time to time, it's usually two people. Mm -hmm. One is William Dalrymple, mm -hmm. and one is Ramachandra Guha. Yes. They write these very aggressive articles in the press, mm -hmm. saying that they are the only people who know how to write accessible history, and everyone else in the in, in the academy is an idiot and only writes uh, this opaque history for th three other people. Uh, and we are all supposed but to feel I'm ashamed when we read these articles. There. I'm not coming from there. I'm not. Neither of us is coming from there. I know. I know that. I know that. But I want to tell you. So you know. So then, when you get these accusations, you say to yourself, "Oh my God! You know, what am I supposed to?" Do? I usually keep quiet, which is not easy for me. So, uh, <laughs> so, but but I think that the deeper question, which is there, is this: that you know, their prejudice, which they are coming from and which a lot of publishers come from as well, is that, I mean, they think that you sh have to put on another hat and write some kind of, you know, uh, history where you don't have words which are more than three syllables wrong, and uh, where there should be no references to anything which is unfamiliar to, you know, some sort of bottom 40% of the population mm -hmm. of readers. And this is, the, this is writing accessible history. And this is, you know, your, th then you have your, your 10,000 copy 
uh, you know, edition, uh, edition, edition. right? Uh, whereas I think what is really interesting is that, uh, I mean, for instance, you know, I wrote a book on, 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 on uh, uh, Vashka da Gama about 15 years ago. Ram Guha wrote an, a review of it in which he said, this book is damn difficult to understand. You know, I have a lot of difficulty understanding it and so on and so forth. Now, this book gets translated into French and all kinds of people are reading it. Now, this either means that the average French reader is more intelligent than, than the Ram average, which, which, I, which, <laughs> which I have my doubts about, or it actually means that you don't really have to compromise in that kind of way. I mean, you, you, I certainly have never cultivated obscurity or opacity. It doesn't come naturally to me in the classroom. It doesn't come naturally to me when I write. But at the same time, I don't feel that I have to put this sort of, you know, dancer's cap on and write this book either. So this is, I think, really yeah. what the interesting yeah. thing is. Can we, can we actually engage with in, in this way, in a creative way with, mm. the, with the audience? And I think that the more uh, historians say to publishers and readers, look, we feel that we can still hold our ground mm. and we can draw the readers in. Yeah. If you're willing to do this, mm -hmm. I think you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, the problem is that every, you know, uh, now, you, you know, I have the person who runs Random House India telling me the same thing as Ram Goha and William Dalrupal, so what can I do? Paying uh, you a compliment though. Are they paying you a compliment? They're saying, great yes, that you write. We, we know you can write a simple, uh, accessible prose. Why don't you do it? You know, I tell you, you know, I am someone who did cultivate a little bit of obscurity because I was very nervous <laughs> right in the beginning. I mean, I'd never had a philosophy course undergraduate or postgraduate in my entire life. And I was in with the politics of and demand and so on. So I wanted to write in a way that I would be taken seriously. And it was obscure prose. I mean, I sent them the subaltern uh, speak to my editor saying, this thing is too complicated and long. Please cut it. They didn't cut it. They didn't change it. And you know, I'm bearing that burden. But I will say that now I write much more simply, but simple prose is not necessarily easier to understand. That's the problem, you know, <laughs> it's, that's the real problem. And in fact, if they say, can you write simply, I will say, yes, monosyllables. We know plain prose cheats, <laughs> the monosyllables, <laughs> you know what I mean? So to an extent, it's a real fight that is, a, and you're hearing it from someone who did in fact write somewhat of, I'm somewhat embarrassed when I see that the MA students in Calcutta are reading Deconstructing Historiography, say, so tell the board to drop that drop that essay, it's awful. You know, so the thing is, but I will say that you write simply, that does not mean that the lower 40% <laughs> are understanding you. This is a great problem. So, d is there any question that I should have asked you that I haven't asked? If uh, this is your moment, the bands are being called. If not, then I will turn to the floor. What do you say? Yes. I've asked everything? Yes. Okay. I don't know how you've held your tongue so far. These are such provocative speakers. Let's go for it. Um, my question is for all three of you. Um, uh, your discussion reminds me of uh, uh, Sarah Soleri's book, uh, The Rhetoric of British India. Especially Urvashi's uh, uh, comments remind me of um, her chapter, The Feminine Picturesque, which I read a long time ago. But I'm just wondering how what you're advocating differs or is similar to what she advocates in that book, because she does bring in the question of cultural criticism, so it's, it's a, maybe a little bit different, or maybe it's not. And um, yeah, for each one of you, I'd like to hear from each one of you. Um, actually, I have not read Sar the Sarah Soleri book you're mentioning. Um, so you should write I shall. I, I admire her greatly. I read her Meatless Days, which I think is brilliant. And I will read the other one. But if you would like to explain a little of what she's saying, then maybe I, we could respond to it. And, uh, I don't know if either of you has read the book. It's been a long time for me, yeah. It's, it's, okay. um, it's, not, um, it's, it's not autobiographical. It's really um, a book, it kind of turns Edward Said's Orientalism on its head. Uh, she does call for greater specificity in, when looking at history, and she does uh, call for looking into the blind spots. Um, she, the chapter of the feminine picturesque is about um, women's lives, which were largely undocumented um, um, at the time of uh, British India, and, and, and she talks about how these women, uh, you know, exploring their lives, uh, even though they were deemed pretty much 
irrelevant because all they did is, is spend their lives, um, you know, painting pictures of a landscape uh, and, and that even their husbands would kind of not pay attention to them because they were more interested in the Notch Girls. And it's, it's very interesting because you're looking at um, British women who are at, in India uh, considered completely irrelevant, um, but she kind of uh, says, hey, let's take a look at them. You know, and then she says a lot of other things, and um, yeah. It's You're going to answer that question after you've read the book. I mean, the summary of the book is. You'll love it. Much, that particular chapter, you'll whatever. love it. It's a little uh, <laughs> dense because it was written uh, a while back. I, it's been okay. 20 years since I've read it. So, and uh, back in the time when it, she came out with it, a lot of people said, well, she's too, obs you know, difficult to read. But. I enjoyed it, and I think it's right up your alley. Okay, great, okay, thanks. Um, yes, Paul, d you had a question, right? Yes. If we, if we go back to an earlier part of the discussion, probably maybe 35 minutes uh, <coughs> into your wonderful, really thrilling discussion, there was a moment when I think you seemed to exercise uh, a sort of um, communal self-censorship because the, the conversation had turned in the direction of contemporary Indian culture and some of the issues that are at large. Uh, I think all the non-Indians of the room today are, are, have high levels, very high levels of interest in contemporary India, not only in terms of its cultural output, but uh, the, the economic and the social and political issues uh, that exist in the country. Um, and, but once that question was opened, it seemed that all of a sudden you decided, well, let, let's not go there. Uh, I don't mean to be provocative, but are there things that we should be hearing that you chose not to tell us about what's happening today in terms of, in terms of the cultural scene in India, broadly considered? Uh, well, I mean, I, no, I think it was actually Gayatri who said we should not go in that direction quite, uh, to keep the discussion focused on really what we were talking about. Um, I have no hesitation at all in speaking about the disturbing things that are happening in India today in uh, terms of the kind of cultural censorship uh, that is being sought to be imposed and the ways in which it is insidiously making its way into our lives so that it, um, it pushes people who might otherwise have been quite courageous to um, take very ambivalent stands. And it is also, um, Sanjay and I were talking about this when we were walking down, um, you know, when we were discussing this, uh, what we, uh, this panel, and uh, in some ways it is much more difficult to deal with because in India we, uh, the, the claim to be a functioning, if imperfect, democracy is a very strong claim. So you don't expect to, um, to be either subjected to the, um, the violations of those democratic rights or indeed to find it very difficult to confront those or to choose not to confront those. I'll give you some examples, you know, there are uh, speakers at, at uh, college events which are harmless cultural literary mm. events uh, are sought to be stopped by arbitrarily set up guardians of morality because they go against the majority view and uh, the state is silent. So the state does not encourage but does not stop these and that silence is, is very, very disturbing. There's a big discussion going on right now about something called love jihad, which is basically inter-religious marriages which are common across the board but now teams of vigilantes are seeking to stop these, saying that these are um, especially deliberately chosen by Muslims to convert Hindu women to the Muslim faith using the weapon of love. And um, nothing's happening about them. So there's... Yes, there is there protest, but there's a lot of There are examples also of academic freedom that I could yes, discuss, yes. but I'm not going to because I'm not the person who's answering questions. I can talk uh, about it, mm -hmm. but I will let Sanjay say something I to was, Paul's I question. Was recently, I was recently in Delhi and giving some lectures over there, and it's a university context that I know quite well since I used to teach there myself. I'm told that um, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, things that are happening, uh, you know, in one year, 
uh, the Delhi University History Department, which is one of the largest and most prestigious, they have actually recruited uh, t uh, what accounts for 25, I mean, faculty who are now 25% of the whole faculty have been recruited in one year without any consultation of the existing faculty, purely on the basis of executive decisions made by the vice chancellor and a sort of panel of external experts. Uh, many of these people, in fact, themselves confess that they don't know what they're doing in this university department because they don't believe that they themselves are qualified to be there. But um, this kind of thing is happening. There's been a huge tussle about changing the curriculum, and which has been, you know, very much been pushed back mm. and forth. But that predates uh, this. Yeah, this yeah. Uh, yes. But it's been going on. But it will, it will every continue to go administration on. of this sort will bring in yeah. precisely yeah. institutions yeah. are completely. So there's a whole, on. there's a whole, mm. I think, uh, you know, mm. thing going on. I mean, and what is really interesting, or <laughs> sad, is of course that, um, yeah, I mean, the, I think the interesting strategy which is being followed is that at the highest echelons. Uh, they don't say anything about all this stuff. And since they don't say anything about it, nothing very much gets picked up in the media, and certainly not in the international media. But then all the sort of work is done one level below, where it's not important enough for, you know, BBC or The Guardian or anyone to pick it up. And it's certainly true if you read the international newspapers, you don't get, you get the impression that, you know, six months down the road, or four months down the road, you know, things are, uh, the growth rate is a bit disappointing, but for the rest, it's business as well. usual is what you would think, but it is not actually. I no. think one of the things that's very uh, troubling for us uh, is that no opposition can be constituted. Yes. This, is the, this is also a big problem. I mean, okay, democracy brings in p uh, people, but on the other hand, we have not been able to... Con no. That for me is altogether alarming. And there's much more that can be said. One thing I will say as a literary person, because the media blitz was, of course, amazing. And just near the, the elections, I went uh, to, uh, back to India to vote. The, um, just near the elections in Calcutta, there were, I have gotten off and talked to people. Yeah, I'm an old lady, I can say anything. I've talked to people, I said, what are you talking about? Because I hear this whole uh, account of how our friend was a sadhu, and you know he was like a you know great renouncer from the Himalayas and so on and so forth. And I have personally, but it doesn't. I mean that kind of uh, crude interference <laughs> doesn't really work. I mean one person over against this very sophisticated media. But nonetheless, that is another thing: the mm -hmm. use of uh, fiction as history mm -hmm. in a crude way. Yeah. That's something that we should. Mm -hmm. We should really stand uh, up against it. Mm -hmm. That's it was amazing, yeah. and of course destruction of files. I mean, anyway. I think there's a question here, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. Thank you uh, all. Three persons uh, were talk, which was uh, thought provoking. Je vais continuer en français maintenant, puisqu'il y a une traduction simultanée, ça ne pose pas de problème. Je voudrais juste faire deux ou trois remarques et ensuite poser la question. Les remarques sont les suivantes. Souvent, euh, on parle de la partition entre l'Inde et le Pakistan, mais on oublie que la frontière n'était pas bien établie dans la nuit du 14 au 15 août 1947. Je ne me rappelle pas du nom de, de la personne anglaise là, qui était préposée à tracer la frontière, mais je peux retrouver la date. Mais il y a des familles qui ignoraient s'ils devaient être, s'ils seraient au Pakistan ou bien en Inde, à minuit, à l'époque où l'Inde naissait. Je pense que ça, c'est très important, et je, on peut vérifier donc ce fait-là facilement. Deuxièmement, je voudrais dire que, là, je commencerai par une anecdote, avant de poser la question. Je crois que c'est Georges Bernanios, ou je ne sais pas qui, qui parle des Français, un couple moyen allant en Angleterre, en Grande-Bretagne, et arrivant là-bas, il voit Victoria, Trafalgar, et puis il se dit, tiens, c'est bizarre ce peuple-là, il ne célèbre que les défaites. Voilà. Donc, c'est pour montrer que okay. l'histoire est enseignée de façon différente en Grande-Bretagne, en Angleterre et en Allemagne. Alors là, je rebondis un petit peu sur ce que disait okay. Urvasi Boutaria. Voilà, yeah, je pose la question. Actuellement, entre la France et l'Allemagne, il y a un comité qui est en train de refaire l'histoire. Donc, de la même façon que vous avez dit tout à l'heure, entre Bangladesh, l'Inde, et le Pakistan, il devrait avoir un comité. Est-ce que vous êtes pessimiste ou optimiste 
think so. so. Do we have you a question? The last question, which is between uh, there's a now a sort of Franco-German uh, commission. Yes, to which is rewriting. Can we do this with regard to in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, for instance? <laughs> I mean, what's the possibility? Yeah. I see. Yeah, some yeah. people who can't understand. Maybe you can just uh, go over the question. So the question, uh, the yes. question yeah. was that between France and Germany now, uh, there is a commission, they are looking at history jointly. Is it possible, can we do this between Bangladesh, Pakistan and India? Um, in, a, in an ideal world, yes, it would be wonderful. But whether we will or not. But having said that, I should say that at least... Um, at the feminist, uh, level of feminist engagement across South Asia, there is a lot of both collective research and collective history of partition of 1971 that is being written. So um, it's not, it's not, c'est pas le même, qu'est-ce que vous dites, scale? Echelle. Echelle, voilà. Donc vous avez parlé, mais quand même, c'est quelque chose de très important. Okay. Another question? Yes. You talking to me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Sanjay. Uh, the, the question of as things going silently, unnoticed, voluntarily by media, or mysterious. Um, choices and faculty at major universities that are politically or economically uh, influenced. Do you actually think it's worse in India than in France and the States? Um, actually, I would answer it uh, slightly differently. I think it's very difficult to make these lateral so, comparisons yes. because, I mean, you know, you could ask, I mean, in France there's all kinds of deep structural yes. problems having to do with recruitment from certain institutions. I mean, do you stand the same chance if you come from you know, X as opposed to Y and so on. These are all ways of doing it. But I think what is more interesting from my point of view is uh, within India itself, when you look at sort of different moments and different periods, let's say over the last 20 or 25 years, can you look at or trace moments in which things are going distinctly better or worse when there is a more or less of a problem with the institutions? And what are those circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. I think that is, an, uh, that is an interesting question. And I think that... Uh, because uh, it seems to me that right now what is happening is something which is also happening because this is uh, the second time when there's a lot mm. of uh, people are in power mm. and they have learned something from the first yeah, time. Absolutely. So they've learned not to pick their fights in public. Mm. They've not learned not to make, sure, uh, to make sure that certain stuff doesn't get into the first page of the newspapers. Mm. Uh, and they've learned that there are ways of doing things which are more effective because you, know, you don't have to trumpet this from the ramparts of the Red Fort. But it, it's enough to actually have uh, someone filing a little court case over here, uh, leaning on someone over there, uh, telling a third publisher that he will get to uh, publish the collected poems of the prime minister, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because the prime minister write poems, uh, writes poems on, on the side. Yes, so so and the social media. Yeah. The, um, and, and then the, the social, social media, media, of course, which is a new thing, which was not <coughs> so much there in the late 90s. So I think that what is really um, easier to make sense of is how these, inside of the Indian context, if you make the comparison, you know, and we've seen, after all, very bad times, after all, you know, um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, and, and uh, all of you are, you know, the emergency and the 70s and what that was like, and, and you know. So, that, I think, is really where we are. I think that we are in a, in a moment when, when uh, you know, this sort of s very surreptitious kind of below the surface stuff is happening uh, and eventually, I hope that people will catch up with it. We also share something which is beyond national boundaries, which is using the discourse of development across the world mm. as justification for yes. all kinds yes. of, well, very kinds much of things, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, in very different ways yeah. in all kinds of countries. But that, again, as I said yesterday, that's the beginning of a conversation. Mm. But I think we are probably, unless somebody is going to have a stomachache, if they don't ask a final question, I think this is, and my boss is nodding his head, I think the moment uh, has come for me to really thank these thank two thank wonderful you, people and uh, bring this to a close. Thank you.